Thanks everybody for the opportunity to speak on this topic this morning of pseudoarthrosis. Um, Matt Bauer is one of the Navy PGY4s rotating here at San Diego Spine. Um, so this is a very broad topic. Um, I kind of wanted to break it down into more general um, themes and things that we can really impact preoperatively uh, as surgeons and intraoperatively to uh, affect change in our outcomes. So a few main questions I want to answer during this presentation are, first of all, what is pseudoarthrosis? Who is at risk? How do we prevent it? How do I identify it? How do we fix it? And should we fix it? Um, so it's a very controversial topic, starting with the spelling, which made the literature review of this topic rather challenging. Um, but after pulling the internet, the without O spelling appears to be pulling out by a small margin. Um, so for future reference for myself and others. Uh, so there's a linguistic definition, pseudo from the Latin false and arthrosis for joint, but with relevance to spine surgery, it's defined as a failure to obtain solid bony fusion and the diagnosis is usually reserved for greater than one year after the index surgery. Uh, the scale of the problem, uh, it can be broken down in, into kind of hundreds of iterations based on uh, different levels, different surgical techniques, various use of implants and biologics, but I think broad strokes are that uh, it is not uncommon and uh, it is a phenomenon regardless of where you are in the spine, um, being cervical, thoracolumbar, um, or isolated lumbar, and whether or not you're doing surgery from the front, from the back, or both. Um, so the risk factors I'd like to touch on, I kind of break them down into biological risk factors and mechanical risk factors. So starting with biologic, um, of going back to, I think, what we often talk about uh, with regards to nicotine, um, in spine surgery, starting with, uh, with basic research on animal models, uh, we always talk about nicotine's effect on vasoconstriction and microvascularity, but really it goes all the way down to the genetic level and affects genetic expression of growth factors in the fusion mass, uh, kind of on a microbiologic scale. So not only does it constrict vessels, but it also decreases angiogenesis and inhibits osteoblast differentiation, which obviously would have an effect on fusion. Uh, and so... Again, this translates to a real effect on the ability to form a solid fusion as demonstrated in the second uh, animal study, uh, which showed in a treatment versus control group of those exposed to nicotine and those not a uh, 0% fusion in nicotine group versus 56 in uh, the controls. So for its clinical effect, uh, this kind of classic study by uh, Glassman et al. demonstrated that those who never smoked and those who quit smoking for greater six months post-op had significantly lower non-union rates compared to those who smoked and didn't quit. This also translated to sort of a rudimentary functional quality of life metric of return to work, which was significantly worse for those who kept smoking. Uh, interestingly, quitting pre-op had no statistically significant effect on union rate. Um, I think this could be explained by the basic science evidence that demonstrates that the first three to four weeks of fusion is the most impactful on the ultimate success of arthrodesis. Uh, this study by Anderson et al. suggested that there may be a dose-dependent effect of smoking on cirrhosis rates, looking at a number of cigarettes smoked per day. Um, and those that smoked less than 10 cigarettes per day had uh, a comparable fusion rate to non-smokers versus those that smoked greater than 10 cigarettes per day at a very high non-union rate of almost 20%. Um, this more recent large uh, all-payer database review of about 32,000 single-level lumbar fusion uh, kind of looked at the effect of the clinical impact of nicotine itself as opposed to smoking in general. As we know, there's lots of other toxins um, derived from smoking other than nicotine. And so by looking at nicotine replacement therapy, they kind of isolate that and its effects. And it showed that uh, patients who converted to nicotine replacement therapy within 90 days of surgery had common complication rates more similar to smokers than non-smokers, although there were no statistically significant differences in the rate of pseudoarthrosis. Um, so kind of onto the next biologic factor and somewhat of a mechanical factor of obesity. Uh, it's well described as a risk factor for multiple post-operative complications, notably infection, blood loss, and all-cause revision, as well as DVT. But there are very few studies out there that specifically look at its effect on 
fusion rate. This prospective study of 137 consecutive ALIFs uh, did demonstrate the rate of pseudoarthrosis and subsidence was statistically significantly higher in obese patients, but that did not necessarily correlate to worse outcomes uh, with regards to FS SF12 and ODI. Um, as for endocrinopathy, uh, I think it's one of the first places we should look to affect change in preventing pseudoarthrosis. Endocrine abnormalities are ubiquitous amongst uh, patients undergoing uh, spine fusion as demonstrated by multiple studies, and it is often in the form of vitamin D deficiency or osteoporosis, as shown in this study published in 2019. Um, about 82% of, of patients undergoing uh, spine surgery, spine fusion surgery rather, had at least one known pre-op endocrine abnormality. And of those uh, sent to endocrine after developing a arthrosis, 98% of those referrals uh, pop positive for some sort of new endocrine diagnosis, most commonly, again, vitamin D deficiency and osteoporosis. Um, so this uh, prospective observational study by Ravindra et al., again, demonstrated a uh, high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency, defined as less than 20 nanograms per deciliter, of about 23% in uh, a consecutive series of 133 elective spine fusion cases. And they found an odds ratio of about 3.5 uh, uh, related to pseudoarthrosis and vitamin D deficiency, um, leading to a pseudo rate at one year of about 20% without vitamin D deficiency versus almost 40% of those with. And it also seemed to affect the time diffusion uh, and not only the non-union rate. Um, this is from a, a large review, kind of looking at the entire body of evidence on vitamin D deficiency in spine surgery. And I think what this tells us is that uh, a few of the key findings that I kind of boxed down on the right is that there is a very high prevalence of hypovitaminosis D in spine fusion patients. Um, and that fusion rates and outcome scores appear to be correlated with vitamin D levels. And then there are also some studies that appear to correlate it directly with a risk of non-union. And, and so I think the question is, what do, we, what do we do about that? And is it practical? And this study um, just published uh, last year in current orthopedic practice looked at the, <clears throat> the uh, cost effectiveness of supplementing vitamin D and found that it is highly cost effective uh, based on their cost assumptions, which in which testing vitamin D is substantially more costly than the actual treatment of a deficient patient. Uh, Non-selective supplementation was actually substantially more cost effective than even screening and selective supplementation, but both are significantly cost-effective rather relative to, um, to not addressing vitamin D deficiency in the first place. Uh, and so kind of one step beyond vitamin D is kind of the end organ result of that uh, with decreased bone mineral, bone mineral density. And I think while you can draw, draw a straight line between poor bone mineral density and mechanical failure. I think the connection between osteoporosis and the biology of fusion itself may not be as direct, uh, but there is some literature to, to suggest that there is at least a univariate correlation between osteoporosis and pseudoarthrosis, even in single level fusion. Uh, for example, a study published in the Journal of Neurosurgery in 2020 looked over 5,000 propensity matched single level fusion cases compared to those with normal uh, BMD to osteopenic and osteoporosis patients and did find uh, an odds ratio of about 1.7 and 1.9 of pseudoarthrosis with osteopenia and osteoporosis, uh, respectively. Um, so I think for me, there's still this question of whether an osteoporosis is a mechanical problem, a biological problem, or both when it comes to pseudoarthrosis. Uh, I, I like this study because I think uh, the comparison head to head comparison of bisphosphonates with a anabolic like teriparatide or Forteo demonstrates nicely that Forteo improves more than just the mechanical properties of bone. And I kind of reached that conclusion based on the fact that bisphosphonates had similar rates of screw loosening to Forteo, indicating similar mechanical characteristics of the bone. But Forteo did show much higher fusion rates uh, with an odds ratio of 2.3, and that's relative to bisphosphonates, not to controls. Uh, and so I think that indicates that there is a biological deficiency at play here in osteoporosis um, at the fusion mass itself and the direct osteoblastic stimulation of by Forteo and anabolics like it uh, stimulates the fusion mass itself 
and not only optimizes kind of the mechanical environment. Um, I think uh, one of the new kids on the block and a rising star in the non-union literature is the use of PPIs in spine fusion surgery. Um, kind of back to the basic science, this is a rat study published in 2019, which looked at 38 rats um, those and divided them into a treatment arm of those exposed to a PPI and versus those that weren't and found that fusion rates, while fusion rates overall were not statistically significant different because the fusion rates were so high. I think they kind of waited too long to, um, to sacrifice the rats and evaluate them. Um, they did evaluate the quality of fusion and found that the average fusion scores were significantly lower in the pantoprazole group, um, meaning they, have, uh, they had an overall lower average volume of uh, newly generated bone in their fusion mass. And so if you struggle to recall what you guys might affect bone metabolism, here's a useful flow chart that I found um, that kind of outlines a series of feedback mechanisms of calcium metabolism that are downstream from PPI therapy uh, that affect the upregulation of PTH and um, therefore uh, ultimately to increase bone resorption. In this more recently studied paper out of Rothman, uh, looked at its effect in, in the clinical setting and demonstrated the statistically significant association between PPI use and pseudarthrosis with an odds ratio of 3.5. Uh, so for the next biologic risk factor of diabetes, back to the rat studies, this looked at 20 controls versus 22 insulin-dependent diabetic rats uh, that underwent posterolateral lumbar fusion <clears throat> and found that uh, there were statistically significant lower fusion rates in those with insulin-dependent diabetes. Uh, found that they had lower bone mineral density, lower overall bone volume, and on histology, interestingly, increased level levels of inflammatory cytokines at the fusion mass, which they kind of is what they attributed to the decrease in fusion rates too. And so, looking at this in the in the clinical setting, there's not a ton of literature specifically looking at fusion rates in human diabetics, but what little we have suggested the clinical results are actually comparable to non-diabetic patients. However, uh, there was a subgroup uh, in, in this series of patients with more advanced disease um, defined as the presence of insulin dependence and or neuropathy, which did have worse results. And I think uh, in the future, a study which included results stratification based on preoperative A1C or specifically insulin dependence would advance our understanding of the interaction between diabetes and, and, uh, and spine fusion. Uh, so next up on biologic risk factors would be NSAID use. Um, we talk about this a lot, both in the spine world and in, in the remainder of the orthopedic world. This is kind of the obligatory rat st study that a lot, I think a lot of people reference when we talk about this topic and whether or not it's a real concern or not. And my literature review on this was actually pretty, pretty eye-opening. Um, so they, they took, uh, a, again, a treatment versus control group of rats. The treatment group was treated with three milligrams per kilogram of endomethacin, and for reference, the not to exceed human dose equates to about half of that, and found that uh, the treatment arm has sub substantially higher rates of non-union, with only four of them achieving, four out of about 42, achieving any sort of solid fusion versus uh, versus about 34% fusion in the control groups. So that's 5% versus 34%. So this group of rats was sacrificed much earlier, which allowed them to... Um, have overall a lower fusion rate. Um, so I think fast forwarding to what I what is our what I believe is our best clinical evidence to date, and we find that patients with short term exposure to high dose toradol have about a three x risk of developing pseudarthrosis. This is a meta analysis of fourteen hundred patients. All of them had inset exposure of less than two weeks post op, and they looked at. Patients with, uh, so they find that a short-term exposure and looked at those that received low-dose uh, Ketorolac versus high-dose Ketorolac. Uh, and they looked at a handful of other NSAIDs. None of the other ones aside from Toradol had a significant impact. But when looking at Toradol, they found that um, those that received high-dose uh, Toradol had, again, about a 3x risk of developing arthrosis. Again, the, what is defined as high-dose Toradol, I, I don't think are really uh, dosages that would be commonly used today of a greater than 120 milligrams in a day. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it, it is a significant clinical impact at higher doses, although we have limited 
data uh, to elucidate the effect of a longer duration of exposure with a short or with, excuse me, a low dose of NSAIDs. Um, and so what do we do about it uh, other than avoid NSAIDs? I think this, this uh, again, a, a rodent study, back to the rodents uh, from 1999, uh, looked at the effect of NSAIDs, but kind of advanced us to the age of, uh, of kind of the ubiquity of using BMP. And so they had three groups in this study, a control group, uh, an NSAID exposed group, and then a group that was exposed to NSAIDs and then have BMP2 soaked graft and found that NSAIDs, again, had a substantial impact on fusion rate uh, of less than half of the control group, but this was uh, compensated for very effectively by the addition of BMP, which had nine of nine uh, rabbits go on to uh, develop fusion. And so uh, looking at this now, bouncing back to the human studies, um, this is an award-winning paper published in the Spine Journal uh, in 2022. It's a placebo-controlled, double-blinded, randomized control trial, which you don't see a lot of in orthopedics, uh, <clears throat> which took the concept from the prior rat study and translated it into the clinical setting, showing that in the, the era of BMP-enhanced graft, the use of short-term low-dose NSAIDs is safe and likely beneficial to short-term outcomes. Uh, despite this very nicely done study um, that does have very compelling results, I think we can all agree that these results based on uh, one to three level MIS TLEPs may not translate perfectly to other procedures like big open deformity surgeries uh, and that these may call for a higher level of caution with the NSAID use. Um, so speaking of large deformity surgeries, um, moving on to more of our mechanical risk factors for pseudarthrosis. Uh, here's a study out of WashU that published on 144 cases of adult spinal deformity, of which 24% had pseudarthrosis. And the statistically significant risk factors that I were identified were kyphosis at the uh, thoracolumbar junction of greater than 20 degrees, hip osteoarthritis, which kind of speaks to the hip spine relationship, which has been um, a hot topic in literature in the last decade or so. A, the use of a thoracoabdominal approach, uh, greater age, persistent sagittal imbalance of greater than five centimeters at eight weeks post-op, and then what they define as incom or what they term as incomplete sacral pelvic fixation, which is defined as no L5-S1 inner body and no iliac fixation. I think the vast majority of these speak to mechanical problems, some of which we can, um, we can affect. Uh, and one risk factor that I think we can affect the surgeons is, is the uh, thoroughness or quality of sacral pelvic fixation. Uh, in this study by Cho et al., uh, they were able to reduce their lumbosacral rod fracture and pseudarthrosis rate to zero by transitioning to multi-rod constructs. Uh, granted, this was a relatively small cohort of patients uh, of only 31. Other common sites of failure in adult spinal deformity surgery are at osteotomy sites, particularly three-column osteotomies like PSOs. Uh, this group found that about two-thirds of their non-unions occurred at the PSO site. Other common problem areas uh, are the high-stress uh, junction sites, thoracolumbar and lumbosacral junctions. Uh, for this reason, these are probably good areas to focus your limited autograft and BMP intraoperably, which is something I, I see Dr. Mundus do routinely. Um, and that uh, in, in this particular uh, patient cohort, those revised for their uh, pseudarthrosis did achieve a, a significant improvement in ODI, which was not seen uh, ac across all groups, which we'll see later in some of the other literature. So as far as how to diagnose pseudarthrosis, um, I think the bottom line up front is that no test is perfectly reliable in isolation, and this is because of imperfections not only in the imaging technology, but also in the variability of the interpretation of that imaging. Uh, so you have to rely heavily on clinical suspicion to aggressively pursue the workup of this diagnosis. And in 2023, despite the many sophisticated tools that we have, the gold standard for diagnosing serothrosis remains surgical exploration and fusion. And I, I think exhibit A of, of why uh, we have trust issues with regard to diagnosing serothrosis is if we look to the FDA's radiographic diagnostic criteria for lumbar fusion, they call for dynamic assessment on flexion and extension films with these kind of defined parameters. But we know that's a bad idea. Um, not only is inter and intra observer reliability notoriously bad when it comes to measuring dynamic changes on plane films, but even in an idealized computer-assisted finite element analysis, uh, 
uh, like this one, we know that the elastic properties of bone make each fusion type behave differently and each um, kind of quantity of fusion behave differently. And this study uh, that evaluated four different fusion types as well as the complete, completeness of fusion uh, was unable to identify a single motion cutoff that could sensibly be applied universally across all fusion types. So dynamic changes um, doesn't necessarily make sense um, unless we were to really parse out each individual type of fusion and kind of define parameters for each one, which may, may be a little more helpful. Um, so if we can't trust the FDA, uh, who can we trust? The AANS published these guidelines based on extensive literature review and expert opinion, which offered some valuable guidance, I think, um, for their strongest recommendation of grade A. Uh, they kind of recommend uh, against static lumbar films uh, as a standalone method to assess fusion rates. So that's the only strong recommendation they could make is that plain static films are not reliable. For their grade B recommendations, uh, they break it down, uh, this is regard to lumbar spine, they break it down to posterior lateral lumbar fusion versus anterior uh, lumbar interbody fusion. And for both, fine cut CT is recommended. And they state that the presence of intertransverse bridging bone is strongly suggestion, uh, suggested of fusion following PLF, whereas the ab absence of bilateral set fusion is strongly suggestive of non-union for PLF. And then with ALIF, um, they they are able to make a grade B recommendation. The posterior sentinel sign or bridging bone posterior to the inner body is the most sensitive for union. Um, and the uh, anterior sent sentinel sign is the most specific. Uh, for their grade C recommendations, they, they say don't use bone scans. Uh, and so looking at this specifically uh, in the clinical setting, um, this study looked at uh, a prospector of clinical clinical trial that allowed a comparison of frame and imaging modalities to the gold standard of intraoperative exploration. So they had 14 ACDFs that required uh, revision all six months after the index surgery and all had preoperative x-ray, MRI, and CT. And they compared the imaging findings from each of those modalities to intraop determination of pseudoarthrosis and uh, calculated their CAPA values or their agreement with the gold standard and found that CT scans most closely agree with intraoperative findings, but still aren't perfect. And so for reference on the Kappa scale, 0.8 to 1.0 is defined as perfect or near perfect agreement. So CT reached a Kappa of 0.81. So um, not 100%, but, but within that perfect or near perfect range uh, with obviously some variability in its confidence interval as seen there on the right. And uh, whereas planar grass were kind of in the substantial or significant agreement in MRI uh, was lower within that substantial or significant uh, or moderate agreement range. Um, in this uh, larger review of uh, lumbar pseudoarthrosis, um, CT scan again shows the strongest correlation with intraoperative findings of pseudoarthrosis. But even when criteria included findings such as the complete absence of continuous bony trabeculation between adjacent vertebrae and peri implant lucency, so even these findings uh, were observed preoperatively. Uh, based or compared to the intraoperative gold standard, CT still only had a sensitivity of 53 to 63% and a spe specificity of 78 to 86%. So it's still far from perfect. So you really have to lean on your clinical uh, clinical findings or suspicion for diagnosis of pseudoarthrosis, uh, which I think the, the top things would be new onset or persistence of pain, a new neurologic sign or symptom like radiculopathy, or progression of deformity or some sort of mechanical sensation by the patient, which could suggest kind of catastrophic failure, like a popping sensation. And so I think, what do we do about it um, when we do see it? Uh, so in this study, I think is really interesting based on um, 89 patients with one to three level ACDFs. Uh, they were followed out to two years. And even though they had a 32% pseudoarthrosis rate at one year, the vast majority were asymptomatic. And if you kept following them after two year, those that had pseudoarthrosis at one year, of them, 72% were able to achieve union at two years. And by two years, if you hadn't achieved union yet, those patients had statistically higher VAS and disability indice scores. And so at least in the cervical spine, I think it's reasonable to follow them out to two years. And uh, if they're asymptomatic, continue to follow them because because um, they can continue to progress and achieve union. 
certainly well out past a year. Um, when revision is ultimately indicated in the cervical spine, there's good literature to support revising posteriorly. Uh, this is a retrospective review of 120 patients with non-union following an ACDF. Um, those that revised 27 of them underwent repeat anterior procedure versus 93 that underwent posterior uh, fusion. They had a minimum of two-year follow-up and uh, demographically and risk factor-wise were similar and found that the rate of requiring re-revision was much, much higher in the anteriorly revised group versus the posteriorly revised group at 44% re-revision anteriorly and 2% for posterior. Although they did note that the complication rate in the posterior group was higher at 8% versus 4%. Um, part of me wonders if the rate of revision has to do with how much pain some of these posterior spine fusion patients have and why they would not be so inclined to undergo a re-revision relative to the anterior group. Um, I think this, this study provides further context by again demonstrating that 100% of those patients in this study uh, with failed ACDFs that were revised posteriorly achieved fusion at follow-up, um, uh, but at the expense of a high rate of persistent pain and dissatisfaction, kind of as, as we kind of wondered about the uh, prior study. Um, so for the lumbar spine, the literature reflects, reflects very, I think, modest expectations for improvements in those that undergo revision lumbar fusion. There is variability in the literature. Um, but particularly those that are revised for pseudarthrosis, I think the more carefully you indicate them, aside from just the radiographic finding of pseudarthrosis, I think you can improve your outcomes. But for these 170 patients revised for pseudarthrosis, or excuse me, revised lumbar fusions, 38 of them were revised for pseudarthrosis. And those that were revised for non-union uh, had a statistically significantly lower rate of reaching the minimum clinically important difference for improvement of ODI or SF36 at two years, although they did have experience some improvements in back and leg pain. Um, and so I think as for treatment of the lumbar spine, the overarching theme in revision is to do something different. Um, for example, add an inner body or additional fixation as demonstrated in this paper. Uh, so this is from 1998, published in Spine, 25 patients with lumbar pseudoarthrosis with non-instrumented posterior lateral lumbar fusion uh, were revised to A-lift with plus posterior pedicle screws. 80% were greater than one level and they achieved 100% fusion rate. This kind of classic literature, but um, I think it just goes to show you that adding something makes a difference and that's mechanically adding something and biologically adding something is, is where we should look. Um, the other thing you always want to consider is presence of infection arthritis that is highly prevalent in intraoperative cultures, even if it wasn't suspected preoperatively. Um, and this study uh, demonstrates nicely that uh, even in patients that will not have overt signs of infection, uh, they can demonstrate a subtle elevation in CRP and have other risk factors like high BMI. And there's a high rate of contaminants. So these 128 patients, about 20% had a positive culture, but only half of them were ended up being defined as true occult infections by having multiple positive cultures and evidence of inflammation uh, histologically. Um, and so look for it uh, as it can help guide uh, management of uh, these patients with antibiotics postoperatively. Uh, but be aware that contaminants uh, are common. Uh, so I think to summarize take-home points for the risk factors include smoking, endocrinopathies, NSAID use, mechanical factors, and infections. So look out for them and optimize as best as you can. Um, the diagnosis is based on clinical suspicion in concert with imaging studies rather than any sort of diagnostic modality alone. Um, when you're revising, do something different. Uh, add fixation, add biologics. Um, and then regardless of what you do, some patients, whether it's cervical spine, thoracic lumbar spine, or lumbar spine, uh, will, will have persistent symptoms even if revision fusion is successful at attaining fusion. And that's it. Great job. Deep topic, as he said. Yeah, a what bit of a bottomless were, pit. What, what were some of the highlights <laughs> for you? What, what uh, you so I think two or three take-homes that you're going to use 
Um, it, well, you, you may not go into spine, be going into spine, but what would be your take homes for orthopedics and spine? Um, I, I think big take homes for me that can also be applied across orthopedics, uh, specifically with inside use. I think a lot of us outside the spine will dismiss it as kind of fake news, but there's strong literature to support at least high dose. High doses really do impact at least spine fusion rates. And there is large meta-analyses looking at orthopedics in general um, that does show a real impact. So I think uh, paying close attention to that in high risk scenarios, um, like larger fusions or non-union treatments mm -hmm. in the general orthopedic world. Um, in addition to that, uh, I think the use of biologics has been revolutionary. Uh, um, I think uh, we still have a lot to learn about the interplay of nicotine versus smoking. There's even some highly cited peer reviewed literature out there that would suggest that nicotine may even have a stimulating effect on bone healing um, in certain doses and frequencies. So, um, I think we're still trying to figure that out, but overall, I think smoking is a bad idea. Uh, right. No and question. then vitamin D and osteoporosis, sorry. Uh, yeah, rampant in both the general orthopedic world and the spine world, and, and fixing it seems to make a big difference and is cost effective. Yeah, that's a huge one. Those are good news studies. Yeah. I hadn't seen those, but. But it's, uh, it's a, something to keep in mind. Not sure that those people look out for that, but it, it can make a difference. So an easy thing to screen for. I agree. I'd be interested to see if uh, we eventually get to a place where the pharmacology is going to be more widely accepted and approved. Especially, hopefully, as we see more, um, more of the uh, um, PTH analog data come out. Um, that shows higher fusion rate. So maybe in select populations, we'll be able to allow, we'll be allowed to use it for, you know, fusion purposes, which would be pretty cool. I think they've even done some studies of, like, <laughs> injecting Forte into the wound and stuff like that. <clears throat> Hasn't panned out well, yet. They, but. they already have the failure. Uh, maybe was that was that already published? I think it Did was. They published it already. I just remember hearing I, it. I, I I thought no no I mean the. Um, the the pain point or the failure rate is I think already published. It's you know three three point eight x or almost four four times four oh, yeah, point yeah, yeah. odds ratio of failure rate. Huge fusions in that setting. So that alone should compel them <laughs> to pay for it if they can avoid that. Although you have to take that next step and say that you can change it. Um, so hopefully we'll see that. It's really hard to do those studies though because of the um, the pharmaceutical company's inability to support it, you know, because it's off label for them. So you have to do an investigator initiated sort of pro uh, project and then deal with the finances of very expensive medication when it's not covered. But it really needs to be done. It's a huge topic. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you both. Hope everyone has a great Monday.